just don't have uh, computer programmer interns. We had a, like an aerospace engineer for the summer program, so it's a lot of for people who maybe are not. Uh, you don't have to be a coder to do a lot of the internship programs, but it just helps. So it was fun getting that off the ground. On there. Your space, come get that off, off the ground. <laughs> uh, I did not mean that specific pun, but yes, that's a good one. Uh, the, 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 we did get mad at one of the interns for crashing the drone into the wall. Oh. Yeah, was that an aerospace <laughs> No. Nope. I was a computer programmer not sending bounds correctly. I think one of our other our, uh, interns was a master's program person that had like a engineering degree from MIT. It just we attract all sorts. You know, it's the the thing is we're the only development team in North America. So it's the rest is it India and Philippines. So we had to code all the weird stuff. And we were like turning around projects in ten days as demo saying our our Philippines team said, We can't do this in three months and we turn around and we give them a demo app in ten days. Uh -huh. So it's it's trying to hold your developers accountable. I, 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 have, I can rant about offshoring, but I'm not going to. The non rant rant. I think uh, 
we were given like 1,500 or 15,000 square feet for the universe. All right, I guess we're going to the floor for people who have job stuff or wants to announce stuff. Jazz. He'll take over. All right. Sure. Yeah. Uh, you can just continue, I guess. Uh, do you want to do the... Um, uh, does anybody have a job? Anybody looking for a job and stuff like that? Sure, I can do that. Um, I also have a small announcement. Uh, okay, sure. I think it's fine. Hey. Sorry, I'm a couple minutes... I'd say I'm right on time. It starts at 6.15, so... <laughs> um, so Matt uh, this is a JavaScript meetup uh, for uh, people who are interested in JavaScript and related technologies and generally web technologies. Um, we generally have um, a presenter uh, who goes over code or some other JavaScript things. Um, James will be doing this uh, night session. Um, generally speaking, every other uh, month we've been doing presentations and then alternating with um, Node School, uh, which is uh, free classes, free tutorials for various um, learning things like Node or um, uh, HTTP, uh, just other JavaScript things that uh, may be of interest. It's very useful for people who are um, entry, just starting starting uh, JavaScript and also really useful for um, people who have a fair bit of experience even um, because you can brush up your skills on things that you're not necessarily playing with. Um, for example, the um, last month's uh, Node School uh, one of the options was to learn a little bit about the uh, Electron um, desktop AP or desktop application thing, um, which is kind of the groundwork for um, the Atom editor, uh, which is a pretty popular editor for text-based files. Um, so I, uh, effectively, with Electron, you can build um, a desktop application native app um, using full JavaScript code, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Um, so, yeah, notes will last month, or uh, I'm sure they'll do it again next month. Um, you can learn a little bit about Electron there, or or whatever. And there's plenty of people around to um, help you with your questions if you're just getting into JavaScript. Um, so it's a very open embracing community and there's also free food so, so Jess yes uh, go ahead uh, in December December meetup is it Node School pretty sure about I'm that. pretty sure it's going to be Node School um, yeah uh, I haven't verified that so um, most likely it will be Node School though um, I don't see Josh is not here yeah I see Josh so Josh is the guy who runs Node School. Um, we'll uh, send out an announcement within the next couple of weeks for that. Um, and then uh, if you're interested in presenting or uh, you have some ideas about how to do things differently for this meetup, um, let us know. Um, you can just send a message to the, um, to the organizers. Hani is one of them. I'm Jazz. And uh, Josh is the third co-organizer. Um, so just let us know if you have something of interest that you want to present or talk about, um, and you can go from there. Um, so another thing, um, we have at least th two and a half, three years of presentations on YouTube. So this presentation will be on YouTube. Um, if you go to YouTube and just search for MadJS or go to our, um, Mad, uh, go to Meetup and look for links, there's going to be links to, to the YouTube um, channel. So if you miss something or um, you want to re-review what the presenter talked about or any of the presentations for the past few years, 
Um, there's a lot of really useful information yeah, in our archive or on YouTube. Um, so definitely recommend that. It's a really useful resource. Um, he's very kind to um, edit the uh, two, two um, video feeds, make it a nice um, seamless presentation that makes that's um, very useful for whoever um, whoever's interested. So um, present, uh, we were going to go through announcements, um, but. Before I do that, I'm just going to pass uh, around some O'Reilly books. These are left over from uh, last uh, couple months ago. Um, so they're free if you're interested. Um, just If not, just pass them around. And if you are, just take it. Um, also, if you had any from a couple of months back and you finished with it, feel free to bring it back and give it to somebody else in this meetup. I'm just kind of like the library philosophy to share share the wealth. So, um, okay, so announcements. Um, Pani, did you have one? I had a, a kind of annoying announcement for everybody, but uh, bear with me. So, so we've been doing the videos for the past three years, and um, this past summer I pulled uh, a muscle in this area. Uh, so, it turns out the human hand is so wonderful. There are no muscles here. Most of the muscles are in this area and we have pulleys. It's a pulley system. So uh, so I busted a, a muscle around this area and now I have to wear these guys. Uh, some people call it tennis elbow. So I've been trying to reduce the amount of mousing around so uh, I'm a programmer like most of you. Uh, so the short uh, of it is that I, I need some help with uh, with a video and I'm trying to see if we can get somebody else to help out at the beginning and maybe we can go through you know how I do it training or uh, or maybe I can uh, write a documentation on how we've been doing it so and then uh, and then hopefully maybe somebody can take over uh, my um, my right uh, hand has had three surgeries so far. <laughs> uh, I've had a cyst surgery, a trigger finger surgery. So I've been trying to reduce the amount of uh, time on the I'm on the mouse. I'm I'm trying to leave the amount of time on the mouse for you know earning a living, you know making money as a programmer. So if there's anybody who is willing, or maybe a group of people, you know, so we we have 12, 12 uh, presentation a year. Yeah. So if... Six, if you, six, yeah, notes. if you count Note School, right. we, so we don't do video uh, editing with Note School, so please, if you're interested in helping out, and eventually I would love to hand it over to somebody, and um, I'm... Uh, this tripod is my wife's tripod, so it's spoken for. I can't uh, give it away, but I'm definitely going to give away the um, this tiny tripod, the old phone that we've been using, and uh, definitely I'll, I'll probably find a way of procuring a, an old Nexus 7 that we can use. This is my own personal Nexus 7, but we, sh we could definitely get some money to get a Nexus 7 for, the, for uh, Magius. Uh, and I do have another tripod. It's not as tall as this that we can use that I'm willing to donate to the MadJS meetup. We may have to use the table with the, with the other tripod. So, so the tools are there. Uh, the software, it's, I'm using uh, ScreenFlow on the Mac, but it doesn't have to be ScreenFlow. It's bas basically we have two video files. That the, the trick is in syncing them. And... Uh, uh, so I usually sneeze or cough just to, to have a, an audio marker and that's how I sync them, believe it or not. I, I do something weird and I go <coughs> and, then, and then when I listen to them I'm like okay that's where I coughed and that's how I sync the two feeds. And uh, so uh, this is uh, an old Android device and this is a Nexus 7 and believe it or not we have to stop the video every half an hour 
because it exceeds the two gigabyte limit of the old uh, devices. So we we've learned that we stop the video at half an hour and we create a we restarted after half an hour. So we're always below that two gigs uh, limit imposed by the file system, old file system. So that's that's what it is. Uh, just send if anybody's willing to to help out six times a year, that'd be great. Um, maybe we can split them. Just send a send a, a note to the meetup group. That's a good thing. Thank cool. you. And again, it's definitely a valuable resource for um, the whole community. So we appreciate Bonnie's effort on this. But yeah, spreading the load would be useful, I think, is the end goal. So, all right. Cool. Um, any other announcements? Job offer, job opportunities, um, people looking for jobs? All right, then uh, we'll go ahead and go around the second question. Definitely, you can do it. All right, the mandatory cough. <coughs> <coughs> yeah. uh, hi, my name is James uh, Crot. If you can't tell from my GitHub uh, account. Uh, I've been a programmer for probably about 15 years now and specializing in JavaScript for about 12 of it. Uh, I've seen uh, ECMAScript 3 uh, horrors to uh, current day and uh, really there's no bad time to get into JavaScript programming. It's not going to go away anytime soon. Um, so I wanted to, to talk about performance. This is kind of a mashup of two previous presentations I've done, so if it's a little, a little weird... Uh, I apologize for that. Uh, this is in my uh, GitHub repo. You can just go to github uh, slash jcrot and you'll be able to find it. Um, I use a lot of weird specialized tools and a uh, weird environment setup that may not be familiar to most of you. Uh, I have an Angular simple start which just has instructions of how I set up my environment uh, in case something looks weird for you. Um, all right, so uh, a lot of people, when they say application performance problems, um, you know, half the time I've brought in, been brought into consultant things, it's not actually a JavaScript problem. It's uh, people doing weird CSS animations that are making their single page uh, site or application look really shitty. Uh, so, the like, anywhere it's just people doing, like, hey, I put water radius and box shadow on a, all my buttons, and therefore my rendering time is just caused it to look janky. Um, so... Uh, there's a, a nice good reference for CSS triggers, uh, and I have this in my thing that tells you what triggers a, a repaint and when. Um, so generally you can get away with opacity, but there's a lot of resizing and other things that generate a redraw on the page. And you have about 12 to milliseconds or so to, to process your, um, your paints to hit 60 frames a second. Uh, human eye reads around 30, so if you're not really within 12 to 20 milliseconds for your logic, it's just going to look weird. Um, and so uh, we're going to cover a bit of that tonight, but I wanted to go over some other stuff. Um, so some of the tools I use to test with, I do do some, uh, I use performance.now to do some unit tests for performing for certain functions uh, because I have people that write code and edit those functions. And so Part of my unit tests actually will test the amount of time it takes for those functions to run on an average level. Uh, this has mostly be, been done in uh, Chrome, but I uh, it gets kind of weird on different um, systems. Uh, Chrome is coming out with a headless version that will be much better for unit testing in the future, so it won't require you to have it need to be installed, and I can be much better at running unit tests for it. Um, and there's a a little link for a nice person that goes over performance and how if you wanted to do that. Um, I'll open it up real quick. But uh, it's becoming a standard. Uh, a lot of the things, uh, the neat, fun stuff you see from Chrome development tools is using uh, performance.now to track and the HDMI cable is being stupid. Um, but it's just, it's a good read and I recommend you go through it. Um, it's just a 
HDMI cable is really going to drive me nuts. Oh, it's just the, the cable. He said he's been having problems with it. With the cable? I have another cable. No, with the outlet. Oh. Uh, I don't have, I don't, do you have a VGA to? Yeah, VGA as well. I don't have the adapter from Mac, if that matters. I do have the adapter. All right. Uh, this is just not going well at all. <laughs> all right. Which one do you want? HDMI or VGA? Uh, VGA. Do you have the Mac adapter for it? No, I don't. That's my problem. I do not have. Let's try the HDMI. Maybe, maybe a better cable will do it. Does someone have a Mac to VGA adapter with them? Mac to VGA? Yay! Huh? That works too. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, he, did, he said the port's been coming out in the wall. Oh, okay. Uh, Is it my cable there? Oh, here. Okay. We might have to scoot up. I can sit on the floor if I really have to. Restart. All right. So thank you for people helping with technical difficulties. Um, <laughs> all right. So getting back to where um, CSS triggers, um, you know, it's just uh, a lot of the times it's been uh, reading performance, not always your JavaScript. Uh, it's everything else interacting with it. Um, depending on the library platform you use, I tend to use Angular a lot, but... Uh, a lot of these libraries have optimized a lot of these DOM manipulations as well uh, that cause you a lot of the problems. Uh, but we're going to, what I wanted to do is walk through um, a Code Labs class that had gone over this, and they have it on there for um, uh, UD, uh, UD City that uh, has a lot of good classes on this. So this is their example project where they have a news aggregator. Uh, and apologize if people have seen this before. Um, so this is a pretty simple application. Um, it's doing a lot of its DOM manipulation uh, via normal query selectors. Um, don't know how much people want to go over there for you, but there's a lot of rendering problems with this. So let's open up the inspector and see how much fun it is. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. So uh, I do most of my troubleshooting in Chrome for our inspector. Uh, IE uh, Edge uh, is getting a lot better at managing these type of uh, problems. Uh, and they have an entire web page now dedicated to performance issues. Um, you can pull v VMs for pretty much everything you want. And uh, they will do site scans. And their dev tools are actually reasonably uh, fit these days. Uh, so. Uh, I actually enjoy using IE Edge more now than Firefox, which has been a, a real strange occurrence for me, uh, just because from their troubleshooting, because I started my career in working with Firefox and their debugging tools. Uh, so if you haven't played with it, I encourage you to do so. Uh, back to our problem. All right. So if you're not familiar with the developer console, I'll do a quick over overview. This shows you, you can get this by Inspect Elevant or F12. Uh, and you can view different um, tabs on here. Uh, the key tabs I want to talk about are going to be timeline and profiles. So we're going to look at timeline first. Uh, and this is just going to, uh, if you don't have it selected, it will start recording and show you on a load, which is very nice. So you can get a, a nice pretty picture of uh, painting and rendering for the load. Uh, I have it set to have memory and JS profile, but you can do paints and screenshots as well and let's actually put painting on. So it's very helpful letting you know uh, when things run, uh, different output calls. Um, the main of my existence is for people that use anonymous functions. Uh, there is only one time to use an anonymous function, it's that when you're uh, you're doing an initialization to make sure you're doing scoping properly. Um, 
other than that, it's really hard to track down your problems if you don't name your functions. Uh, so, as of what's going on here, he is using a function and he's uh, not naming it. And here's the thing, you can always name your functions. So, we're actually going to go to line 33 and name it. Uh, which one was that? In the, in the service. So the good thing is, is you can always name your functions, and we're going to call this now named. And so the uh, so some of the functions that we're having problem with are uh, now named. So. Uh, you can do this everywhere, and it's really helpful for troubleshooting other people's code, because a lot of the times when I've worked with a lot of different libraries, they don't name their functions, and it's really helpful for digging down and logging out different heap tags if you just go through and start naming their functions to try to get a better idea. Because if it's like, I have five anonymous functions that are taking up all this time, and I have no idea what's going on. Uh, but it's really good about uh, clicking through, so you can always click through, click of the lines to see which functions are being called. Um, it's also really helpful seeing uh, a summary of what's taking so long, so most of this is rendering. Uh, you can go through your years and keep digging into your activities, uh, see what functions are taking the longest, and break down farther into it. Um, if you're doing snapshots, you can also compare via snapshots, but we'll get to that in a second. So this is a lot of information, and it's, uh, it seems a little daunting. But the, the, the best way to describe it is uh, if you're getting down to the bottom of the page on this, uh, something has gone horribly wrong in your application. Uh, and that is main for your rendering. They also have GPUs and rasters for people who like to do games. Um, but this is kind of ridiculous that uh, this much of the timing and processing is being taken up. Um, so the good thing is you can up here you can see your frames per second, you can see your CPU net and heap. And you notice when this is rendering, once something gets to a certain point, your frames per second basically drop down to almost like six. So if I wanted to scroll through this application, uh, it's gonna be really slow. Come on. Do, 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 do. Let's close. So it's it's really choppy. I don't know, it's kind of hard to see on the screen, but I would just tell you if I was a user on a phone using this application, I would delete the application and never use it again. Um, so the good thing is about your network timeline, you can see like, hey, I want to see what's taking so long on a render. So first just make sure your network is loading, because if you're loading resources externally, you're not caching them, uh, that can be a lot of your problems, but most of our resources for the page load up fine. Uh, most of the time for Chrome or a lot of browsers, if you're trying to load more than six files concurrently, that's going to cause a lot of your problems. Um, I actually don't use external images anymore. I 64-bit encode all my images my site used into a CSS file, and I just load a CSS file because it's the faster way to do it. Um, this gets a little harder for a lot of bigger applications, but uh, reducing those number of callbacks is just what's going to make everything play nice. All right, so in this example application, they've intentionally coded some stuff to go horribly wrong. Uh, and as we can see, we're having a lot of rendering and painting uh, is not taking that long, but rendering and all the scripting is what's taking forever. Uh, so what we could do is we could uh, record a couple timelines, uh, but... I think we can dig into our timeline itself to see what's the going to be the biggest problem. So what's going to be the biggest problem is whatever's taking or looks the longest, and we're going to focus on this time frame right here because this is when our uh, FPS goes down to the 2, and you notice on the left, it's nice. you get got a nice 17 to 58 frames per second. It's like, yay, everything's happy. And then everything on here, it's horrible. So the good thing is, is that when you dig into certain function calls, it's going to be very helpful into 
uh, what it thinks the problem is. Uh, maybe not for everyone. So if you look in here, you see a lot of these uh, specific calls, and I'll dig into this more. Uh, and we're down to like one millisecond for this view, so this is kind of getting hard. But you see how many times this action is being re-triggered over and over. So something is forcing a reflow even like almost four times every millisecond. And so if something is triggering it that often, you're never going to get a paint to finish, and so you're never going to hit your 15 to 12 millisecond time frame of what you want something to show. Because really, if you don't finish a paint between 700 and 712, then your application is always going to be choppy because it's going to skip frames to account for that. Uh, so all these refiles, and then you can click on these function calls, and it's giving you the nice warning and gives you the Chrome developer tools information about that. But it takes us right to the function that we're having problems with, and it denotes your time of how long things took. So this is the most important thing I find, is that, sure, I can log performance metrics uh, for unit tests and other stuff, but this digs down to tell me how long things are taking. And so what's taking the longest is this height call. And uh, this function itself is really non-performant, uh, but this height calculation is really what's destroying everything. So um, I think what we're going to do is we're just going to, we're going to not color calculate these stories and we'll just remove this function and see how bad it is compared to everything else. And so what I'm going to do is instead of calling this, I'm just going to come at it out. Save. Oh, why are you hating me now? Oh, you want an end. Oh. Oh, because it's a one line. So I will kill that as well. And you can do this coding directly from the browser and it will rerun it. Uh, it's kind of a little iffy on that for watching that stack trace. Or you can just go in your application. What line is that? That's line 88. So I can go in my app, line 88. And coming out these two things. And then refresh. So let's get this to. Sorry, it looks stupid. So again, I loaded, repainted. Uh, and if you remember seeing it previously, uh, it was mostly red for all of it. Now it's mostly green, except for this long time frame. So, yay, Jane, just forcing those color changes not to happen um, when it's the calculation is removing a lot of our <laughs> bottleneck. But let's dig in more uh, into this specific time frame. So, specifically in complaining about this time, long frames, uh, and they actually use the word jank, which I find uh, uh, amusing. Uh, but let's take a look and see what calls happened right before this. So, XR load, XR load function call, and then a lot of different layout calls are happening. So again, we're going to get really in depth here. So whatever function call this is, on line 33 in data, uh, that's the request story URL. Once I start loading stories, that's when things go out of whack, um, which could most likely be the reason. Uh, since this is just, this isn't going to happen that often because it's only when it pages down and forces a load, I wouldn't necessarily consider that too much of an issue because compared to your application, you're getting a poor load for maybe 20 milliseconds. You're only going to skip a few frames. So you have to learn when you want to go down the rabbit hole for looking at a performance problem. And when it's something that, like, hey, the page is just loading a bunch of crap, maybe I should have a loading screen. <laughs> uh, but narrowing down in specific functions and being able to identify what's causing your rendering problems uh, is really, really great. Uh, so 
that's what I want to cover for CSS rendering. Uh, is there any questions on that, or does anyone have anything they want to explain further on trying to troubleshoot when the browser is painting poorly, it looks like you have a JavaScript problem. Okay. So the next problem is when you actually have a JavaScript problem. Um, so let's hide this. So I had a very, very horrible uh, performance problem that I probably spent seven weeks debugging. So this is my nice little uploader application. Uh, this is a completely web-based file uploader that pulls DICOM files, uh, or JPEGs or MPEGs, uh, and will upload them to a server of my choosing. Um, for my, via normal HTTP request, queues it, does all this fun stuff. Uh, there is over 3,000 lines of code involved just for this application, so it's rather a bit of a pain uh, troubleshooting. Uh, as you can see um, when it's loading, um, I have the same normal loading problems, so like this is a long frame, but it's being loaded. But after that, it doesn't really seem to have any problems on any of the repaints so far. Uh, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to force a new record, and then I'm going to select my folder, and I'm going to select approximately 1,200 files and parse it out through. So this is real-time parsing. It's a solid-state disk, so it's a little bit faster, but... Um, I bet no one will find a Java application that can parse as fast as that. Uh, so what I went through is I stopped my timeline and it's now rendering it now. So I accept the fact that uh, I have a bunch of long frames here and we'll try to zoom in on this. We'll just look at a little bit so it's a little bit easier. So I have a lot of long frames that happen when uh, this is processing. Um, I had to accept the fact that uh, certain things were going to parse poorly and rendering of that. Uh, mainly the reason why the chopping is rendering is when I'm updating files uh, on the page, it's dynamically binding. So every time it reads through a file, it's updating that number. Uh, I thought about throttling or caching that, but it didn't really seem to be a huge issue for me. Uh, the main problem I was running into is that uh, heap size. So... Uh, if you see right on the thing, the fourth line or the blue line is heap management for the system. So uh, I was hitting that black line for my heap. And let me tell you, if you actually do max out your heap for an application, it will look like it's crawling on a 486. Um, it will... Uh, I was, it was taking... You saw it load 1,700 files. I was having it crash heap around 1,100. And then uh, it would crawl, it would take like five seconds for the first thousand, like 45 seconds for the last 700 to load because it was waiting for uh, the memory cleanup to actually let things be put back in the heap. Uh, this is not necessarily a Chrome limitation or an Edge limitation. This is strictly, uh, oh my God, I was putting so many different files into the heap. Let's see what's going on. So uh, I learned a few things. So Previously, I was using uh, Gulp as my build tool, and I, when my page was processing, I was using a heap snapshot tool to dump a snapshot every two seconds to see where my heap problems were going because the timeline is not necessarily really great about looking at heap management. This is really good if you're doing performance, rendering, memory, even CPU, uh, but this is very poor for judging heap allocations. The only really good way to do heap allocations is to hit snapshot. And it's really inconsistent because let's say you're trying to replicate this 10 seconds of what it took and I'm trying to take as many snapshots as it can. It can take like two. So I'm not really getting a good performance look at where my heap state is and how things are comparing through it. So I was using, uh, because my backend is node, um, I was able to use a node heap dump to have it dump down what it was doing like every two seconds so I'd have a consistent view of what was going on. Uh, and then the good thing is it was dumping it in a snapshot profile. So you can actually load snapshots you take externally and then compare them in here. So you can have an external tool, take five snapshots, load the five. You don't have to take it in from Google Chrome if it supports it, uh, which was really helpful. Uh, but when I was taking my snapshots, and I'll take one now, um, and what I would do is I would take two snapshots 
and then I, you can select the two. So I can say I want to compare, uh, comparison, and I want to select against snapshot two. And you see there's no difference here, but if I, uh, I can take a snapshot at a, at a good state. So I can, again, compare against snapshot three. This is at, without stuff loaded in memory. It will show you all the differences of everything loaded in your snapshot uh, before it loads. Uh, however, this caused me another problem. That's not really well documented. So garbage collection. Uh, my problem was garbage collection wasn't managing things correctly. And every time I took a heap snapshot, I never saw the problem. Can anyone guess why you don't see a problem when it takes a heap snapshot? Yes, it, do, it, it forces a garbage collection first before it finishes taking the snapshot. So you can never really see what's not being garbage collected. Uh, so I had to write <laughs> some of my uh, own memory dumps to force it not to do a garbage collection before it took a heap snapshot uh, in my own build. And so the good thing of that was is that that third party uh, snapshot taker in Node was letting me see stuff before it was actually cleaned up by the browser, which was disguising the problem. Uh, <laughs> fundamentally, my problem came down to, um, uh, if you think about it, when every, everyone, this is a very simple JavaScript thing, but when you make a string in JavaScript, uh, it doesn't destroy the other string. So if you have uh, temp plus temp equals to itself plus another string, it just keeps making these string objects uh, into different things, and you get over and over and over. And so... I have, if someone can see this, I have uh, almost 26 megs devoted just to string functions. Um, different th things running on different lines. and But none of these are really huge. I mean, this one's a little bit, but uh, just the sheer number uh, of its processing and going through string functions uh, was the garbage collector couldn't keep up. Because I was reading, uh, when I'm reading files, I read the first, like, one and a half K of it, and then I discard the read uh, afterwards. So File Reader uh, is not, does not like that, because File Reader for JavaScript uh, in, wants you, intends you to read the entire file. So, again, since File Reader was returning a string as a byte array, and I was ingesting that byte array string and parsing it, uh, it was creating strings of the entire object as I was going through it. So what I found was is that when I set things to be strings, uh, it was maintaining the byte stream of the entire file for way too long. So what I ended up doing is that uh, object properties uh, are a little bit different. You can set an object property of dot string or whatever, and you can have a string be a part of an object, and you can force a deletion on those. You cannot force a deletion on strings. So what I was doing is setting up these properties to an object, and as I was going through and done processing them, I was deleting the object properties as I was going through. Uh, because I was, uh, normally garbage collection would pick up on this fine, uh, but forcing the delete told garbage collection, hey, I really want you to delete these. Even though this function is not done running yet, and I'm in a loop, I'm halfway through this loop, and I want you to delete these already because I'm done processing them. Um, so that was a very fun uh, learning experience. Um, I hopefully no one ever has to go through that. But uh, it's really hard to troubleshoot because whether I was looking at it from here, all I would see was my heat peg and not change for, process, for like 30 seconds of it. And then when I was taking profiles and taking my snapshots, uh, I could see that I had a bunch of strings and arrays and other items. Um, but... I couldn't figure out really why those were being associated correctly. Uh, my second problem I had uh, was uh, strong type associations with arrays and uh, maps. So there's, uh, there's a problem where if your object is still associated with another object in an array or otherwise, it will retain those items even if you don't want, you, you don't want them to. Uh, there's a concept called weak maps and, and weak arrays where you can loosely type those. Like, I want to keep this collection but none of these are related to each other. I don't care if I delete half of these while I'm still parsing through this array of 5,000 files. 
So by doing that, I could queue in files through the array as it was reading it off the disk, push items into array, parse them, and as I'm still reading the DVD, <laughs> deleting items out of that weak type array as I'm going through it, and it was disassociating that memory use in the <coughs> two, three, five, ten seconds, whatever it, it was taking to do. So uh, by doing that, the garbage collector was actually doing what it was supposed to and destroying things immediately. Um, let's go. So we can do this again real quick, and I will show you my stop. So I will show you my worst uh, case scenario that I had, and I will clear these out. So you can record uh, an allocation timeline, and that's very similar to the timeline here, and you can record a JavaScript CPU profile. Uh, but I was also having some performance problems, so let's get that started. And I'm going to parse a bunch of files again. So for part of this, I was using a third-party library that I didn't have control over the parsing. Uh, and the fun thing is, is what happens when you start when most of your problems aren't in your code? You're like, I'm doing everything properly, and there's this third-party library, and it's just doing things poorly. Uh, well, a couple of them was Angular itself. So Angular has some built-in loop functions, uh, Angular for each, that is really non-performant after you hit a thousand properties. Uh, and I won't recommend using it for anything large. It really should be only going over. But what I was using it for is I was adding all these things to an object, and I was iterating over that object, which it was intended to do. But the problem is, is that my use case was so far out in left field that even I was making manipulative changes to that object, and even though it never really got over a 1,000 item properties in there because I was deleting and adding, uh, it eventually would stall on the loop, and so I had to come up with some creative solutions. Uh, but the other thing was is that I'm using a parsing library uh, called, uh, uh, it's by Chafee, Dicom Parse. Uh, and I was having a lot of performance problems, and again, this is people not naming their functions correctly because it really is S U E. For the, but I could see where like, hey, my code is not taking that long. My code is only taking about eight percent of, or, or, or is taking up a very small fraction of what's going on here. It is really his code that's causing my problem. All right, so what do I do about that? Well, I looked into it and how he was reading data, where byte stream array and parsing it. Uh, so I. We'd go into the library. Oh, and I'm using source maps, by the way. I don't know if that matters to everyone, but it's really helpful when you minify your code and you include source maps uh, so you can actually see what's going on. But I could see that certain data functions were, because byte streams were being passed in, um, uh, I was finding that uh, certain places, while people use while loops, um, I have a different set of this library where this is used as a for loop with a break condition. Um, so the performance issues with while loops in JavaScript is that uh, it doesn't always meet the condition and end when you want it to for, for destroying that function. So what I was finding is that this, again, anonymous function, uh, was being passed around and the while loop was still running and did a return on it, but it wasn't actually cleaning <coughs> up the memory uh, from that while loop um, until the uh, error handling was done running for this function. So he uses a lot of place where if this, throw an error. And so I had a lot of times where I was getting a parse read problem on an error, and I was logging it into console log like you're supposed to do because you want to go eventually fix this. And just because he was throwing these errors and the way his error propagation worked. Just the act of logging that out to console was causing this stuff to persist in memory as a weak association for those logs, and therefore was causing my heap to overload again if it was a, had a lot of different error messaging. So how you in, handle error messaging should really be um, disassociative of your code that's actually happening. You should only be you should always be returning a function and not throwing the error in here and trying to catch it later because it's going to maintain that entire stack trace uh, for your error messaging uh, when you try to blow it back up. 
So this again caused me a bunch of problems uh, because uh, I like to test with a bunch of weird things that handle um, and everything going through. And I have a library that was actually doing that. So how I handle it now is I do things through a promise chain that still resolve and don't throw errors. So I have a bunch of parsing problems with this file and none of them ever cause me a problem because specifically in Angular uh, um, this is a really horribly nasty piece of code uh, where is it? so I'm using my for loop to go through uh, and pull the functions out I'm doing a IAMF this is the only time this uh, should be used uh, is because I'm initializing this anonymous function to scope the data as I'm going through it because I want this, everything that's happening inside this function, I want destroyed immediately upon close uh, because I want no data persisting after this because I will throw out the errors into a, a function that handles later but I was again having memory persistent problems in here uh, trying to keep track of different files but I, I parse the file, it comes back, it just uses a parse file here, which is using a normal reader. Uh, this should look very common to people if you've ever done file reading properties. You're putting it into an, uh, an array, you're reading, you're pushing it out, you're pushing it back. Um, and then I was setting a bunch of strings for the object. Uh, do I need to stop and restart? Deep at me. So when I was parsing through these files, um, it was using the file reader, and file reader is a very poor function because it likes to maintain data. But what I do everything in here is that uh, all this was happening, it would go through and parse, and then I was basically turning this into a promise. So I'm resolving my promise here, and then catching anything that's failing uh, in a parse failure. So the only times that data would be persisted for a parse failure is if I caught the actual fa failure all the way up into my promise chain and then it would handle it appropriately. Um, so I, error handling is great. It's nice if you throw and catch your errors, but uh, when it causes performance problems, uh, you have to probably catch them higher than you'd really want to make sure that you're actually getting the memory performance you want. Promises. Uh, what else? Um, that's it for that. I had um. There's some things I want to show you about Windows. Windows actually, uh, I found this problem uh, was much more easy to diagnose in Windows uh, because if you're using Windows with Chrome, uh, you can actually their developer tools has JavaScript memory and heat management. Uh, real, real time, time and this, this is just from the task manager functionality. Uh, so when I was running this diagnostics, I would go through and uh, actually look at the heap as it's going through and step through my functions to see how it was changing. Uh, and unfortunately, you just can't do that on Mac. Uh, it just the functionality doesn't there exist for the tools because it's a Windows only um, uh, snapshot renderer. So that's a, if you're having a really weird um, memory management issue, you may actually have to get on a Windows machine. Um, all right. So last thing I want to go over is performance issues in Angular specifically. Um, so everyone's familiar with, like, if you're familiar with Angular, there's a lot of built-in directives, ng-show, ng-hide. NGF. I mean, there's just a ton in there. 
uh, half of those directives are non-performant. Uh, so if you're using a bunch of stuff to show and hide on your page, um, NGF is kind of better because it will not output the stuff to the DOM uh, for it to show what is this going through. But if you're doing a bunch of things where uh, you're using it like you're scrolling or something that's updating very often, it's fine if it's tied to a checkbox. It's not fine if you're using mouse motion or some other scrolling technique to then show and hide certain things. Um, so uh, what you can do is, uh, this is a great article that helped me out, is that you can batch, uh, where is it? So, fine. So you can batch your own stuff in your own digest cycle in Angular, and I made a, my own ng show function, and it would only batch and show those um, every millis every 1,000 milliseconds. So to the user, it was a slight delay when it's checking those pollings, uh, because those digests only ran a timeout every one second. But it made it so that um, different things on the page would not be polling your watchers so much, to where it would actually blow up my page. It would just be skipping a frame or two every second instead of trying to pull these every digest cycle. Um, that's, the, that's not so much a problem in Angular 2 now, but it's just, um, you can log how many watchers are running, and once you start getting about a thousand or more, you're gonna start having problems running through all those watchers every digest cycle. Uh, and there's ways to get around it, but having to um, manage your own digest cycle uh, gets a little bit frustrating sometimes in Angular. Uh, to, where is that? And that was part of my problem I had on the other page. Um, so let's go. Does anyone have any questions so far? I know this is really high level, so uh, and it's I'm so deep into it; it's really advanced. So if you have specific questions, I will I can hit things that you guys aren't understanding. Um, so I wanted to show an Angular 2 app, but I, the Drifty guys still don't have my build system running fine for it. Um, where is it? Uh, let's go back to my other application real quick, and I want to show you one more thing. So there's a couple common configs in Angular that people don't set. Um, like I... Let's view it as a couple gotchas. Um, a lot of my debug enable is set to false for these. So debug enabled, info enabled allows for certain applications like um, Angular Inspector and Angular um, to run. So when I run these type of applications, it's like, hey, there's no information on your app because I'm not publishing it. What I was finding is that I was running into a lot of debug problems that really were just problems with my debugging. So I'll enable debugging to true, and I'll restart my system. Yeah, still make functions within a loop unless you absolutely have to. And so now when I load up, my debugging shows up and everything in there. And what I was running into is that um, these type of tools are published from Angular to make it so that you can easily go through a GUI and a lot of your editors have my default to look at, like, hey, I want to look at what's going on with my scope variables and see performance problems and it's great. Uh, it's really memory, in, memory intensive and problems. So let's do a quick timeline with this open. Parse files again. Let's see, it's probably gonna crash before it. So you can see the how slow this is taking. Uh, when it without the debugging on, it was really super fast. This is me hitting my heap uh, level over and over and over and over and over to where it's just crawling. And I'll stop that because it's just gonna, 
it's, it's just, just going to keep, keep going keep forever. So, so by just having my debugging on, uh, my application is performing. You know, when, when you when you push the level on these type of things, but uh, you can see the heap level up here, and then everything just stops. <laughs> That's how you know you've hit your heap size in, in Angular and in Chrome is because everything just stops. And it doesn't tell you why. Uh, but uh, just by turning my debugging on and getting this information on is I've caused my application to be non-performant. Um, so word, if that's the biggest word of wisdom I provide you is that for the love of God, turn your debugging information off when you're building a production application. Cool? All right. That's it unless anyone has any questions. Yes? Could you go back to what you were saying if you're <coughs> looping through something you want to um, push the errors out somewhere else so you're not... Sure. Just, can you speak a little more about that? I kind of got it, but not totally. So do you understand the concept of promises? Yes. Okay. So the normal throw and catch uh, mechanism for throwing errors in JavaScript does not play well with promises because uh, promises are meant to handle the error catching in its catch function. If you're throwing errors and doing all this weird funky stuff before it gets there, uh, the error messages are not getting passed up and it's not throwing. So uh, promises want you to resolve the promise, but it wants you to throw your error message through the resolved promise. And so... Let's take a look at, so I have a data service, and so I create a bunch of files and I send a bunch of files, right? So in my data service, I only, uh, I create an action, and then I return that action, but all that action is returning is a promise. Uh, so when I'm returning this queue reject or this queue response, this is really a, I'm creating a promise inside there to return that response. So when this gets back to my server, I'm either getting a queue reject for that promise or the promise here. But uh, I, I never will have, I mean, I guess you could have resolve a function in a fraction of a, nano, in a millisecond and then have it actually resolve and not return a promise. But in essence, it's just returning a promise of that response, uh, nine times out of ten. And so if I get a 404 or I get another error when this is happening, uh, I send files, and I will pull up that function. Um, so that's parsing. Uh, all right. So this is where it's uploading my folder, and I'm going through and issuing. So when I create my files to send, it's actually a promise list. I'm resolving all my files that are getting sent as a promise, which then resolves another promise, which then resolves another promise, which then resolves the actual file. Um, so if you throw an error somewhere at the bottom of that stack, uh, it's going to be like, hey, I had an error. I'm going to catch it. It's going to get caught up here uh, for when I do these send files, but um, I'm creating the promise for the actual sending the file in here. It's no, I mean, but it's going to catch the error up here and be pissy. So it's going to maintain the stack. It's going to have to maintain the memory for all the stack traces all the way down to when you initially were sending the file all the way back through, which was very, very non-performant. Um, so what I did is I got rid of all those throw methods, and I just, uh, it doesn't throw an error there. I, my bottom level response handles that error and then throws a promise back up. So I catch all my errors uh, in my data service at the main level when I'm sending a file. And I don't care anymore what gets responded because if I catch it, I'm not actually calling another file. In my catch function, I'm actually calling the same file again and having the promise resolve itself. It's a very incestuous relationship. So it can do that three times uh, before it rejects itself. Uh, so there's not a lot of... Now, watchers uh, in Angular 2 have kind of, and observables have kind of done this already. You can set 
they have promises, but their observables kind of do that, where they've built in repeats. But this was a very hard lacking function in Angular 1.5 and earlier, where you can do this. I mean, this is a really complicated piece of code where I'm having to reject and handle my own errors in a very fundamentally frustrating way. Um, but I catch all my errors when I'm, send when I'm sending, and then even when I'm processing, uh, I'm resolving them via promises, even when I'm parsing uh, through files and I'm handling any file errors that's getting created. Um, so, so the problem with that external library was that it was throwing errors inside some of this code? Yes. Uh, and so when I'm resolving this file and I'm looping through this, uh, so I did two things. I handled those errors here, and I'm instantiating each one of these for loops into a function call. This is not really a good idea, but I got this idea from actually TypeScript because TypeScript does this a lot with classes. So uh, if you had made a class in TypeScript, it was going to do this exact same code when you're looping through. It's going to isolate it, and it's going to say, I don't care if you go have a bad day. You're a class now. You're isolated. I'm going to initially instantialize you, and I don't care what happens around you. Uh, and so the loop, the array it's going through is a loosely typed, and so it doesn't care what happens to this one particular function call instance. It's created, it's destroyed almost immediately, and it's managed. Um, now, would I say like using TypeScript and CoffeeScript, uh, if you were using those language builders, this would have done it for you already, but not even if you're doing extra grip 7 or 6 and it build down to 5, it doesn't do this for you. You have to use one of those structured languages or know that you have to isolate things in this manner to prevent those kind of memory leaks from getting out. Um, but that's the only good thing I see from Microsoft and Google having their unholy union uh, is that TypeScript is being enforced and it's preventing a lot of bad JavaScript from being created. Plus, it, the linter for TypeScript is really mean. Uh, I run it against my code here and it's just like, I hate everything you're doing. And it's just, I'm sorry it has to be done that way because I have to interact with third-party libraries. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Uh, I wish I could post this code, but most of this code is under NDA for not being posted publicly online. But uh, I'm keeping parts of it short enough that you really can't tell what's going on. Uh, anything else? Uh, how many of you guys are using TypeScript currently or CoffeeScript? So, uh, CoffeeScript, you guys are the Python developers that take up JavaScript, right? Maybe Probably. Ruby developers. Yeah, Ruby developers as well. Uh, you're going to start seeing in the next two to three years a lot of your C-sharp developing friends uh, who are going to be using Angular 2 and TypeScript and think they're front-end developers. And they will be, because Microsoft has made it easy that they can use their IDEs and structure now to build Angular 2 apps. And it's going to be a very weird world because um, you get brought on a project and you're like, I want to use JavaScript. Well, we're using TypeScript. And like, what's TypeScript? And then it's just one of those things that you're going to have to learn. And then you're going to have groups that are going to be like, we're just using XMScript 6 or 7. And then you have to know those syntax languages as well. Um, the good thing is, is that all the JavaScript and TypeScript uh, – is basically the same. You can just throw JavaScript into TypeScript files and it doesn't care. Um, but you're going to start seeing classes, you're going to start seeing all this functionality. Uh, that's going to stop a lot of bad JavaScript from being written. That's all, that's all TypeScript is there for. It's for those C-sharp developers that want to be front-end developers, but they don't have the skill set, so they have this mishmash of stuff that they know. TypeScript looks a lot like C-sharp, and it's really helpful and easy for them to use. Cool? All right. Well, it was fun uh, presenting to you guys, and I hope you guys have a great night.
that's where we're going to put on it. Do I have that? This is yours, right? Yes. 